Planned Parenthood clinics across this nation, thousands of protesters will descend on hundreds of clinics, screaming in defense of those that they say are babies. And yet who will be here today for these embryos that they decry as babies? No one, not one single person. Welcome to Gods and Glass Tubes. Hi, I'm Errol McGinnis. I'm the producer of this mini-series, uh, Gods and Glass Tubes. Uh, again, I stand find myself standing in front of the Arizona Reproductive Medical Services Clinic, uh, this time to give you a little familiarization as to what this clinic is about and who operates it. In specific, this clinic is operated by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Drew Moffitt. Uh, Dr. Moffitt is uh, he's, he's pretty famous in the industry of in vitro fertilization and fertility treatment services. Um, Dr. Moffitt has uh, given several conferences here in the, in the, uh, in the valley uh, regarding in vitro services. Uh, and in, uh, you might see in one of his Yelp reviews, in one of those conferences, he was asked by a woman to provide her with assistance in fertility and he denied her. The reason he denied her was not so much because of medical issues. She had no medical issues that would preclude her from getting treatment here. The reason that Dr. Moffitt denied her was because it went against his own religious convictions. You see, the woman who asked him was allegedly single. Dr. Moffitt has stated because of his religious views he cannot help in, uh, single women or women who are not married to men with in vitro fertilization. So this brings up another issue in that uh, Dr. Moffitt gave an interview on a uh, local station here. And in that interview, he described the process of donating these fertilized embryos. And in that process, he described that women could, and, and men, uh, couples, could pick out the certain characteristics that they wanted in their child. They could pick out intelligence quotients, they could pick out hair color, eye color, and this leads to the speculation that is it possible that they could also pick out the race of their baby. So uh, in bringing these two together, uh, one of the big Christian arguments is, uh, is when they argue, first of all, uh, the obvious, they, they, they call the embryos that arrive at Planned Parenthood, they, they address them as babies. In here, in that entire interview, he never addressed any of the embryos that he referred to as babies. On numerous occasions, they were referred to as tissue. This leads to the argument and speculation of uh, one of the Christianity's strong arguing points as they stand in front of the Planned Parenthood clinics, the argument of consistency. So here, we have a doctor who has no issue at all with creating human lives, even creating extraneous human lives, in a test tube. At any point in these fertilization process, the donation process could include up to 12 eggs. If all those eggs are fertilized, you now have 12 blastocytes. Uh, this clinic requires a minimum of three blastocytes. This clinic also advertises that they don't recommend any more than three blastocytes because of the chance of multiple births. So, uh, in the interview, uh, in, in fact, one of his testimonials includes a woman who came in, got a procedure, uh, she donated an unknown number of eggs, one of them was implanted, and one of them was carried to full term. She now has one child out of an indefinite number of eggs. The rest of them, nobody knows where they went. If those eggs are currently not wanted, where they're going to go is they're going to be donated to research. They're going to go to the exact same source that Planned Parenthood's tissue donations go to when they are collected. So here lies this great moral and ethical question. A, is he right or is he wrong in taking these lives, these lives that not created by any deity, these lies that were created by human beings inside of test tubes and inside of glass pipettes, taking those lives, immersing them in liquid nitrogen for whatever period uh, somebody will, is willing to pay for those lives to be immersed in liquid nitrogen, and then when they're done, when they're done with those lives, 
They take them and they destroy them for medical research. It brings up the other uh, ethical question. Is he justified in taking a tailor-made order for a baby? Some mother who wants a baby that has blonde hair, blue eyes, or brown hair, and almond eyes. Or in his own words, there was a couple that wanted a baby that liked chess. So they're supposed to go through all of those donations and they're supposed to find a blastocyte that came from parents that like chess. So that baby deserves to live because that baby was conceived in the test tube of parents that like to play chess. Now the other baby, because the other baby might not so much care for chess, and this is supposed to be some preconceived determination, that baby does not get to live. And this is, uh, this is uh, a practice of a doctor who is quite good with his conscience as he creates these extraneous uh, lives and the, those peers around him, those Christians who promote him for what he does will go to Planned Parenthood and decry the lies that were created at Planned Parenthood that are going to be terminated via surgical procedure. So which one is right? Are we okay as a society with terminating a life by breaking a test tube and dissecting the contents? And yet we're not okay with, break, with ending a life, terminating a pregnancy by a surgical procedure or by a medical procedure in which the patient is administered medication and caused to eject, the, the, in the doctor's own words, tissue. So where does tissue stop and a baby begin? This creates such a gray area that nobody can explain it. Nobody, can, no man can explain it. And yet here, this man who operates in this facility and, you know, and those who operated this facility with him are okay with making money hand over fist. They make quite a bit more than any Planned Parenthood clinic could possibly conceive of making. And yet, this practice is okay. This practice is okay to the extent that as I come out here and I film, uh, once a week, twice a week, any given random day, any given random time, there's nobody out here protesting. And yet this, this facility here will discard more lives than any Planned Parenthood could possibly even conceive of terminating. So this is something for us to think about because not only does it affect the realm of Christianity, now it's affecting the realm of the law. Because you see, as I stand out here on Thomas, uh, on Thomas Street, right here at 17th Street, down the road in the county, in the, uh, in the state capitol building, there's legislation on the books that's trying to get passed to limit what Planned Parenthood can do. And they want to place those limitations by placing ridiculous limitations on the clinics. They want to change the cabinet size of the clinics. They want to change the width of the hallways of the clinics. They want to change the types of equipments that the, uh, that the clinics can, uh, can, can carry. They even, want to they even want to mandate that the doctors who operate in those clinics must have admission privileges in hospitals. And yet the hospitals are barred from giving admission privileges to those doctors. This is currently not just happening here in Arizona. It happens in Kentucky. It happens in Ohio. It's happened in Mississippi. Currently, of the states that I know of, Kentucky and Mississippi each only have one practicing uh, clinic. And in the case of Mississippi, the doctor has to come from out of state. So where does this end? Will we ever come to an amicable agreement? as to what is considered life? Or do we just stay with the status quo? Where in the case of Planned Parenthood, and only Planned Parenthood, then life begins at conception. In the case of this building behind me, life doesn't begin at conception because conception was in a glass tube. Until such time as some certain set criteria is met, they can be called blastocytes, they can be called tissues, but they cannot be called humans. And, and yet we go on. We go on with this moral dilemma on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and uh, basically on a, on a basis that's gone for decades and decades now. From the inception and the legalization of Roe v. Wade, the, the argument, the key argument that won that decision was personhood. And yet the Christian community wants to argue that personhood 
cannot be granted to these babies that are going into Planned Parenthood. For some odd reason, Planned Parenthood is some kind of special, special environment where personhood cannot be allowed. And yet in here, where, or, that, or that personhood must be mandated. And yet in here, there's nobody decrying these embryos. There is nobody here telling, you know, saying that these embryos need to have personhood. Nobody wants these embryos to have personhood. If this clinic was protested, there would be a doctor who was a multimillionaire would come out here and he would, he would cry and he would moan about how horrible these people were for protesting this facility. And yet when those people protest Planned Parenthood, he's there cheering them on every bit of the way. And so it goes. This is a hypocrisy that is, uh, that is currently pervasive in Christianity. And now this is the hypocrisy that they're attempting to make pervasive in the law. And it's videos like this that hopefully will stop that. And until such time as these Christians do come out, they do start protesting this facility, they do start decrying that these babies here uh, are deserving of personhood, then I will continue making these videos. I will continue calling these people out by name, by number, by location, and I will continue pleading to the state of Arizona that, uh, there, that there has to be a common ground. If there can't be a common ground in declaring personhood, then there must be a common ground in not declaring personhood. If these babies here don't get personhood, then the babies at Planned Parenthood don't get personhood either. There has to be some consistency. If Christianity wants to be moaned uh, consistency, then Christianity needs to be held accountable for consistency. So again, I wrap it up with uh, the one simple sentiment. If you wish to keep praying for me, by all means, keep praying for me. Because I will certainly keep thinking for you. And once again, I thank you for watching. And have a great day.